Riddled with continuity errors and plot holes, and plagued by the notorious CGI removal of a super stash, the theatrical release of Justice League was a huge disappointment for many fans. However, the Snyder Cut has finally been able to fix a long list of mistakes, errors, and unanswered questions from the Joss Whedon version of the movie. yippee ki movie lovers, I'm Jan, and in this video I'm explaining the top 17 DC plot holes and problems fixed in Zack Snyder's Justice League. Of course, spoilers ahead, so take care. The theatrical release of Justice League was vague and short on details about the Mother Boxes and why they'd only awoken after Superman's death. Even worse, the Whedon reshoots ended up contradicting the timeline established in Batman v Superman for the experiment that Silas Stone performed on Victor, because in the theatrical release, Silas didn't get hold of a mother box until just after Superman's death. It was shelved till the night Superman died. Then she lit up like Christmas. They brought it to Star Labs, where my father recognized it as a perpetual energy matrix. This is inconsistent with BVS, where Wonder Woman saw footage of Victor's transformation into Cyborg with the mother box before before the battle with Doomsday and death of Superman. The Snyder Cut instead remains faithful to the original timeline, and establishes that well before Superman died, Silas Stone found a way to harness the energy from the Mother Box. Victor's father activated a Mother Box more than a year ago when Superman was still alive. Didn't call out to Steppenwolf. None of the boxes did, not until... Not until Superman died. It's like they were afraid of him. That line also explains that it was very specifically Superman's death and the powerful, anguished death cries of the Kryptonian, which we see in the opening scene of the Snyder Cut, that awakened the Mother Boxes to send a message out to Apocalypse, as Diana later explains to Bruce. Something woke the box my people guard. It called out to the dark place, to one of Darkseid's conquerors. Something introduced during Whedon's reshoots on Justice League was the idea that parademons can sniff out fear. Batman used a criminal's fear as bait to catch a parademon at the beginning of the movie, and Steppenwolf mentions it when he's threatening the hostages from Star Labs. The stench of your fear is making my soldiers hungry. This creates a plot hole though, because at that moment, the Justice League are hiding just outside the room where the hostages are being held, and Flash reveals that he is petrified. I'm afraid of bugs and, um, guns and obnoxiously tall people. Which begs the question, why didn't the parademon sense Barry Allen's fear and discover him? On top of that inconsistency, this fear concept is used in the final battle against Steppenwolf, when he becomes suddenly afraid of the Justice League after Superman and Wonder Woman destroy his axe. No! This cannot be! You recognize that smell? Fear. Okay. Me. This ends up being a rather disappointing way for the movie's big bad to go out, especially in comparison to the final battle in the Snyder Cut, which is much more epic, with Superman first slicing off one of the villain's horns, and then the team killing him and sending him through the boom tube to land at Darkseid's feet. Thankfully, the whole parademon fear subplot and resultant plot hole have been completely removed from the Snyder Cut, and instead, the only significant mention of fear is this badass moment after Steppenwolf arrives in the Amazonian stronghold. I will bathe in your fear. Daughters of Themyscira, show him your fear! We have no fear! cryptic moment from Bruce Wayne's nightmare that's never been fully explained is when Future Flash arrives to give Batman a message. In the Whedon reshoots, it seemed it was partially explained when Batman arranged with Alfred to bring in Lois Lane as a backup in case Superman's resurrection went wrong. Diana was right about the risk. If the plan goes south, we're gonna bring in the big guns. Although in both versions of Justice League, it's Lois who arrives just in time to calm Superman down, in the Snyder Cut, this has nothing to do with Batman. Lois is simply making her final visit to Superman's memorial by herself. In fact, Snyder has said that the Flash's warning from the future about Lois Lane is referring to something much bigger, and several scenes in the Snyder Cut elaborate on what he's hinting at. Barry Allen was right here, and he said to me, Lois Lane is the key. She is, to Superman. I think it's something more something darker. We know from Cyborg's premonition that Lois will die, and the epilogue scene between Batman and Joker also reveals that Batman was somehow at fault for her death, which led Superman to go to the dark side. You need me to help you undo this world you created by letting her die. The Snyder Cut also includes an interesting additional scene with Lois where we see she has a pregnancy test in her bedside drawer, which she then picks up and goes to use in the bathroom. 
Following on with the baby theme, there's a notable difference in the Snyder Cut in the final scene at the Clark family homestead, where Lois is carrying a baby basket into the house rather than the removal box scene in the Whedon Cut. Snyder, in fact, has said that Lois's pregnancy is something the studio had asked to be removed before he stopped work on the movie in 2017. A debatable plot hole that some fans have noticed from the Whedon cut of the Gotham Harbour Tunnel scene is that it shouldn't be possible for the Flash to move people around safely at super speed when they aren't wearing a protective suit like him. The Snyder Cut resolves this issue specifically by not having Flash move anyone around in the tunnels and instead he simply zips back and forth showing people where to go and later on he uses his super speed to rapidly move a stack of rubble that's about to fall onto the hostages when they get out of the tunnels. The dangers of the Speed Force are also clearly shown in the Snyder Cut scene where Barry Allen's shoes disintegrate as he turns in them at super speed when he goes to rescue Iris West. It goes without saying that Snyder's Justice League restores Henry Cavill's stashless Superman scenes, doing away with the dreadful opening sequence from the Whedon Cut, where the Avengers director seemed so desperate to be acknowledged for his hard work on the film that he included this sign. But more importantly, fans finally got to see Superman in his iconic black suit from the Death of Superman comic book storyline, which had been teased before the theatrical release but was never delivered. The Snyder Cut also connects to and elaborates properly on the nightmare scene from Batman v Superman, part of a much larger storyline and something which was essentially ignored in the theatrical cut of Justice League, leaving fans wondering what the point of it had been. The Snyder Cut, on the other hand, begins to answer some of our questions about that enigmatic dream from BVS. The first revelation comes in the premonition of the future that Cyborg sees just before Superman is resurrected in the Kryptonian ship. In that vision, we see a dark future of a dead Wonder Woman with Darkseid arriving to conquer Themyscira, the death of Aquaman at the hands of the Dark God, and a grieving Superman holding the charred remains of Lois Lane as he's about to be brainwashed and taken over by Darkseid. The Snyder Cut's epilogue also continues Bruce Wayne's dreams of a post-apocalyptic future as we see the Dark Knight forced to work with his enemies Deathstroke and the Joker. This scene is also interesting because for many fans it's a marked improvement on Jared Leto's Joker that we saw in Suicide Squad. The tattoos on his head, which were generally disliked, have gone, or at least covered up, and this scene now confirms his involvement in the death of Robin, which was alluded to in Batman v Superman via the graffitied costume in the Batcave. Why you sent a boy wonder? to do a man's job. This scene, which Snyder added in reshoots specifically for this cut, is also a nod to his idea for a Batman and Joker film, something the director has admitted is unlikely to happen now. A character who got completely shortchanged in the theatrical version of Justice League was Cyborg. It seems he was the main character who suffered from the crazy studio mandate that the movie had to be a maximum of two hours long, which seems especially ridiculous given that in the Whedon cut, screen time was given over to adding a random Russian family in order to supposedly make the conflict more relatable to ordinary people. In the theatrical version, Cyborg wasn't an especially interesting character and his backstory was extremely underdeveloped, with just a few slight references to the accident in which he lost his mother and the reason that his father experimented on him. In fact, Ray Fisher has even said that almost every single scene of him in the theatrical cut was from the weed and reshoots. The Snyder Cut thankfully revolutionises our view of Cyborg, putting him, as Zack Snyder himself has said, at the heart of the story. We get to see Victor Stone's kindness, his troubled relationship with his father, him learning to use his powers and becoming a crucial part of the team, from fixing Batman's flying fox to confronting his own insecurities in order to defeat the Mother Boxes. On top of that, watching his own father sacrifice himself in order to place a tracker on the third mother box is a particularly emotional moment and adds another layer to the character, in sharp contrast to the Whedon version where Silas Stone is still alive at the end of the movie. Another character who gets more development in the Snyder Cut is Barry Allen, with this version setting up The Flash's upcoming movie much better. Barry saved the world when he reversed time, allowing Cyborg and Superman to separate the boxes before they formed the Unity. We also saw him reverse time briefly during the Superman resurrection scene, when he didn't quite reach the mother box in time to charge it initially. This ability in the Snyder Cut, together with the first mention of the multiverse in the DCU movies so far, and the Joker discussing alternate timelines with Batman in the epilogue, set the stage for the Flashpoint movie in a much more satisfying way than the theatrical version did. 
And although Barry is still the comic relief among the group in both versions of the film, gone are some of the worst parts of Whedon's reshoots, such as Barry drawing on a prison visitor's face, the tedious brunch jokes, and of course the moment where he falls on top of Wonder Woman, a tiresome joke that Whedon obviously finds so hilarious that he recycled it from Avengers Age of Ultron. We also lost several other cringeworthy Whedon additions, such as Martha telling Lois Lane that Clark said she was the thirstiest girl he ever met, and Aquaman calling Wonder Woman gorgeous while under the influence of the Lasso of Truth. And there's an interesting little fix to the scene where the Justice League break into Star Labs. In the theatrical release, the date of birth of Barry's fake military profile is November 2010, which at the time of the film's release, 2017, would have made the character only seven years old. In the Snyder Cut, the date's been fixed, so the birth year is now 1997. Also much improved and fixed in Snyder's Justice League are the villains. Steppenwolf's design has been vastly upgraded together with his backstory and motivation for collecting the mother boxes. It was a really intriguing added detail for his armour to change with his mood, and even retract entirely when he prostrates himself in front of Darkseid. Steppenwolf is still a big CGI villain in both versions, but his character is much better developed in the Snyder Cut, which makes the final battle with him and the way the Justice League defeat him much more satisfying than in the theatrical version. But on top of that, the Snyder Cut also properly reveals the real big bad of the movie and of the Snyderverse as a whole, Darkseid, who was referred to but never properly explained in the Whedon Cut. In the Snyder Cut, Darkseid also replaced Steppenwolf during the extended and much more satisfying flashback to the invasion of Earth when the Amazons, Atlanteans, Gods, Green Lanterns and men successfully resisted and repelled the villain and his minions. Something that puzzled many fans at the end of the theatrical release of Justice League is how Lex Luthor managed to escape from Arkham Asylum. The Snyder Cut doesn't fully explain this, but does give a hint in the much longer epilogue scene with Luthor and Deathstroke on the boat. I heard you were a few clowns short of a circus. I was. Thank you until the good doctors at Arkham helped me find some much-needed clarity." This clown reference may hint that the Joker was involved in Luther's prison break, and the mention of doctors here might also suggest that Luther bribed some of the staff at the facility to send over a bald look-alike into his cell while he escaped. Another unanswered question from the theatrical cut some fans have wondered about is how Aquaman knew about the Atlantean mother box. The Snyder Cut's restoration of a deleted scene between Arthur and Volko helps clear this up. The Snatchers have come from the dark place. They're looking for it. The mother box our people guard is not safe. Go to the stronghold of Atlantis. Likewise for Wonder Woman, the inclusion of a deleted scene where Diana visits the Shrine of the Amazons explains how she learned about Darkseid's previous invasion of Earth. The Snyder Cut isn't entirely faultless, of course, and there are a few inconsistencies that this version of the film seems to have introduced, in particular how it relates to the Aquaman movie. For example, Mira has a very strange British accent, which is completely at odds with the American accent she had in the Whedon Cut and the Aquaman film. Where the legends say Atlan's trident was forged. He's as short-sighted as he is cruel. And then there's the way that Aquaman tosses his shirts into the ocean and smashes whiskey bottles by the shore, but complains about rubbish being thrown into the sea in his own movie. Now, did you spot any other problems that the Snyder Cut fixes, or any new plot holes in this version of the movie? Comment below, and if you enjoyed this video, do leave a thumbs up. Tap here to check out some more videos you might like, including the deleted alternate ending and cut scenes for The Boys Season 2. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. Yippee-ki-yay, movie lovers!